the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, cabinet announces that Sri Lanka's cabinet of ministers have approved a substantial loan of 200 million dollars from the World Bank to be obtained through a development policy loan. The country is poised to enhance its global standing in artificial intelligence following the cabinet's approval of a new national strategy aimed at advancing the country's position in the cutting edge field. The Colombo stock exchange remains unchanged as a downward trend persists showing no signs of recovery. And Canada follows US and European Union's lead with 100% tariff on Chinese electric vehicles and 25% of Chinese steels and aluminium. From Studio 24 Here's Anuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Cabinet Spokes Minister Bandula Kunavardhana announced that Sri Lanka's Cabinet of Ministers has approved a substantial loan of 200 million US dollars from the World Bank to be obtained through a development policy loan. He further elaborated that this loan is specifically linked to the economic reforms being carried out under an international monetary fund program which aims to stabilize and enhance the country's economic framework. This loan forms part of the totaling financing package of 400 million dollars with the initial tranche already completed and secured. The decision to proceed with a loan agreement was made following a proposal presented by President Ranil Wickremesinghe in his role as finance minister. The cabinet's approval will enable the signing of the loan agreement supporting Sri Lanka's ongoing efforts to implement critical economic reforms and achieve long-term financial stability. The 37th annual conference of the Organization of Professional Associations of Sri Lanka was held yesterday at the Shangri-La Hotel Colombo with the participation of the President Ranil Wickremesinghe and the Central Bank Governor Dr Nandalal Virasinghe. The annual conference held under the theme Towards Sri Lanka's Sustained Economic Growth brought together professionals from various sectors. The OPA which consists of 52 member associations representing 34 sectors boasts a membership of over 60,000 professionals. Addressing the gathering, President Vikram Singh outlined his objective of achieving a swift economic recovery for the country noting that the substantial progress has been made towards this goal. The president stressed that sustaining this recovery and fostering long-term economic growth require adherence to the agreement with the International Monetary Fund, describing it as the only viable path to overcoming the crisis. He also acknowledged the significant relief Sri Lanka has received through this agreement. Also addressing the event, the Central Bank Governor Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe emphasized that the short-term overcoming of the economic crisis of Sri Lanka was driven by coordinated, transparent and robust measures undertaken by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. This progress is not by chance. but is the result of coordinated transparent and robust measures undertaken by the central bank of sri lanka and the government supported by numerous public and private stakeholders even like opa as well as international agencies and lenders and our creditors the key driver of our progress has been restoration of macroeconomic stability achieved through a sound monetary policy measure strong fiscal consolidation measures and implementation of long overdue structural reforms these efforts have created a conducive environment for growth for us to move forward Sri Lanka is set to elevate its global standing in the field of artificial intelligence with the approval of a new national strategy by the cabinet. This strategic initiative is designed to position Sri Lanka as a key player in artificial intelligence by leveraging its potential across crucial sectors such as agriculture, health, and education. The strategy aims to harness AI to drive sustainable economic development and address poverty, ultimately contributing to a more equitable distribution of AI's benefits through society. The national strategy envisions Sri Lanka becoming a regional hub for AI by the year 2030. This ambitious goal seeks to boost the country's global competitiveness and enhance the efficiency of public services. Although Sri Lanka has made notable progress in its digital transformation efforts, it is yet to achieve a significant impact in the realm of artificial intelligence. The Controller General of Immigration and Immigration says that the issuance of passports will be limited due to the limited availability of blank passports. Issuing a special announcement in this regard, the Controller General has therefore requested applicants to apply for passports only if their needs are urgent. 
The announcement also mentioned that the new electronic passports are set to be introduced soon, with the tender already awarded to a foreign firm. The controller general stated that in order to bridge the gap until the e-passports are launched, the department has arranged for an additional 50,000 standard passports which are expected to arrive by the end of October. This statement further noted that the statistics for the department indicated that only about 23% of passports issued last year were used for international travel. Considering this, the public is kindly urged to postpone non-essential passport applications until the new stock arrives. The Department of Immigration and Immigration apologizes for any inconvenience caused and assures the public that efforts are being made to resolve the issue promptly. Commissioner General of the Excise Department MJ Gunasiri dismissed claims of significant areas in three major government revenue sources, namely the Indian Revenue Department, Sri Lanka Customs, and the Excise Department as myths. Speaking at the press briefing titled Collective Path to a Stable Country, held at the Presidential Media Centre yesterday, he clarified that outstanding tax amount for these three institutions totaled only to 90 billion rupees. He also noted that it is typical for any country to have a 3% to 5% of its total tax revenue in outstanding taxes. Commissioner General Gunasiri further highlighted that these three institutions have record revenue in 2023, surpassing 3 trillion rupees. He added that after 25 years, they succeeded in creating a surplus in the primary account. Addressing the media personnel, Commissioner General of Excise further explained that three institutions under the Ministry of Finance, which are the Indian Revenue Department, Sri Lanka Customs and the Excise Department, work within a legal framework to collect state revenue and despite some groups spreading misinformation about large tax arrears, the actual total unpaid taxes for these institutions are under 90 billion rupees. Most of these areas are from government's entities and legal actions are underway to recover the funds, meaning these amounts should be considered deferred taxes. <laughs> Let's take a short break now. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. There has been no deviation at the Colombo Stock Exchange as the negative streak continues to prevail. Both the indices recorded losses at the end of today's trading, marking the fourth consecutive days of losses after last week's session with a mixed sentiment. To get a briefing on today's market performance, we now turn to Minal Vikramagi, who is joining us from Capital Alliance Securities. Today, the Columbus Stock Exchange concluded on a negative note compared to yesterday due to high levels of selling during the trading session. The market ended at 11,093 points marking a 106-point decrease from the previous session, with a turnover of 513 million rupees. The SL20 index also experienced a downward movement of 34.38 points to end the day at 3,154.73 points. Notable institutional engagement was observed across various sectors, with slightly higher turnovers recorded on John Kills Holdings and Ceylon Coal Source PLC. The top five gainers for the day were SMB leasing, voting and non-voting, Blue Diamonds PLC voting and non-voting, and Tess Agro non-voting. The top five losers for the day were Industrial Asphalts, East West Properties, Tess Agro, Buller and Phipps, and Kalin Tires PLC. How has the credit supply in the economy evolved in the second quarter? We have Zaima Jihan standing by from First Capital Holdings to give us the insights. Uh, we can look at the credit supply in three main aspects uh, as per the quarterly survey by the central bank. Uh, and that would be the willingness to lend, demand for loans and non-performing loans. Uh, so first if we look at the willingness to lend within the banking sector, this index has improved consistently and recorded an increase in the second quarter of 2024 compared to the previous quarter uh, with the improved liquidity positions. Willingness to lend uh, to the retail segment has been higher compared to uh, corporate and SMEs uh, during uh, the second quarter. Uh, next, uh, if you look at the demand for loans, uh, this has increased within retail, corporate and SME sectors. Uh, but there was a reduction in demand from uh, SOE sector during the second quarter. Uh, so we are seeing this improvement in demand uh, supported by the reduced interest rates, improvements in the business environment and a relatively stable exchange rate. Uh, lastly, if you look at how uh, non-performing loans have changed during the second quarter, 
uh, in an overall sense it has remained on a slightly high side owing to a uh, higher cost of living and uh, heavy tax burden that impacted both uh, retail and corporate segments however uh, within the soe sector npls declined uh, possibly due to the restructuring and the rescheduling of loans and uh, in terms of the outlook uh, for the third quarter of 2024 these aspects are expected to see further improvement and uh, if you take demand for loans this will continue to improve as uh, interest rates are expected to decline further also uh, the consistency in policies and stable exchange rate will further drive demand and on a similar sense we at first capital also anticipate 7.5% growth in credit during uh, 2024 Uh, with the expected recovery in key economic sectors. Gold prices were little changed today, holding steady above the psychological $2,500 per ounce level due to the investor optimism about imminent U.S. rate cuts and ongoing concerns over the Middle East conflict. Spot gold was nearly unchanged as $2,513.74 per ounce, having risen more than 21% this year and reaching a record high of $2,531.60 on August 20th. U.S. gold futures, however, fell 0.3 percent to $2,548.20 per ounce. In Lebanese cities, residents experienced only partial relief yesterday after one of the most intense exchanges of fire between the armed group Hezbollah and the Israeli military in recent months. Oil prices slipped slightly today after rebounding more than 7% of the previous three sessions on supply concerns prompted by fears of widening Middle East conflict and potential shutdown of Libyan oil fields. Brent crude futures were down 30 cents or 0.4% at $81.13 a barrel and the US West Texas intermediate crude futures dropped 40 cents or 0.5% to $77.02. The 7% rise in Brent and 7.6% rise in WTI in the previous three sessions bucked a broader downtrend since hitting its 2024 peak of $95.17 in April. The downturn was driven by concern over global crude demand, particularly from China, and through the summer, which is typically a peak demand period. The Sri Lankan rupee has depreciated slightly against the US dollar at commercial banks in Sri Lanka today compared to yesterday. According to People's Bank, the buying and selling rates of the US dollar have increased from 294 rupees and 68 cents to 295 rupees and 17 cents and from 305 rupees and 26 cents and 305 rupees and 77 cents respectively. Now we'll look at the exchange rate against the other global currencies. A short commercial break. Now this is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Digital banking has just become financially rewarding, with the Commercial Bank of Ceylon launching a groundbreaking industry-first initiative to award reward points for transactions on Combank Digital. The bank has announced that even a simple utility bill payment via Combank Digital can now earn rewards points from the bank's Max Rewards scheme. Encompassing all new registrants as well as existing users of Combank Digital, the bank's single omni-channel digital banking platform, the Max Rewards, will award up to 300 points for a single transaction, enabling users to accumulate points that can be redeemed for purchases or other benefits. The bank said Combank Max Rewards offers a comprehensive point structure combining one-time payments and monthly rewards, and the process of redeeming points would be similar to the redemption of points accrued on credit and debit cards issued by Commercial Bank. A single Max Reward point is equivalent to one rupee. 
It also offers customers the functionality of investing in a range of fixed deposit products in both rupees and foreign currencies, obtaining loans against fixed deposits and applying for personal loans. Adjudged the best mobile banking app in Sri Lanka by Global Finance in 2023, Combank Digital is one of the top five financial apps in use in Sri Lanka. TVS, a renowned global brand celebrated for its motorcycles and rickshaws, introduced its popular model, the TVS Radar 125, to the Sri Lankan market yesterday. The official launch event took place at the Shangri-La Hotel in Colombo, marking a significant addition to the country's motorbike offerings. The TVS Raider 125, a notable entry in the 125cc super sports bike segment, combines advanced engineering with a fresh, stylish design. TVS has enhanced the Raider's appearance while maintaining its reputation for performance and efficiency. At the heart of the TVS Raider 125 is a robust 125cc engine that offers a smooth and powerful ride, and the engine produces a maximum power output of 13.38 PS and a torque of 11.2 Nm, ensuring both strength and reliability. The TVS Raider 125 comes equipped with several cutting-edge features. It includes a reverse LCD digital speedometer for enhanced visibility, comprehensive underseat storage, and an air and oil-cooled three-valve system. Additionally, the bike boasts a signature animalistic LED headlamp, a distinctive LED tail lamp, and disc brakes with synchronized braking. Overall, the launch of the TVS Raider 125 highlights TVS's commitment to delivering high-quality and innovative motorcycles. Hatton National Bank PLC of Sri Lanka had submitted a non-binding offer to acquire the Bangladesh operations of the bank Alphala Limited. This bid placed HNB in direct competition with Bangladesh's bank Asia Limited, which had also made a non-binding offer for the same assets. The acquisition represents a key milestone in HNB's strategic plans to become a more influential player in South Asian financial sector. By targeting Bank Alphala's established operations in Bangladesh, HNB aims to tap into a lucrative market with significant growth potential. The preliminary approval from Bank Alphala's board of directors is a positive step, reflecting confidence in strategic alignment between the two institutions. However, the transaction's completion is contingent upon navigating the complex regulatory landscape, which requires approvals from both Pakistani and Bangladeshi central banks. Bank Alphala's recent announcement underscores the procedural steps necessary for moving forward, highlighting the importance of regulatory compliance in such cross-border deals. Once the necessary approvals are secured, HNB will proceed with a detailed due diligence process to assess the value and potential risks associated with Bank Alphala's operations in Bangladesh. Let's take a short commercial break. Global updates coming on the other side. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The Asia-Pacific equity markets were mixed today, tracking losses in the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq overnight, while investors assessed industrial profit data out of China. At the same time, rising tensions in the Middle East weighed on the global market sentiment. The Japanese yen depreciated towards 145 per dollar, pulling back from a three-week high as the US dollar gained some ground. Profits earned by China's industrial firms increased more than expected in the first seven months of the year, amid Beijing's continued efforts to boost the economy. Investors now look ahead to official Chinese PMI figures for this month's due for release on Saturday. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq ended lower, while the Dow edged up modestly to close at record high. Investors were waiting for inflation data for clues about the path of interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve. The S&P 500 and Nasdaq closed lower on Monday, as AI heavyweight NVIDIA dipped ahead of its quarterly report later in the week. The Dow, meanwhile, ticked up modestly to close at a record high. The S&P shed about three-tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq lost more than eight-tenths of a percent. Shares of NVIDIA dropped two and a quarter percent ahead of its earnings report Wednesday, the stock market's most closely watched event of the week. 
But some investors worried that anything short of another stellar forecast from NVIDIA could shatter Wall Street's rally in AI-related companies, including Microsoft and Meta Platforms, shares of which closed lower on Monday. Fellow Magnificent Seven member Tesla lost more than 3% after Canada said it would impose a 100% tariff on imports of Chinese electric vehicles, following the lead of the U.S. and European Union. Among other movers, shares of Caterpillar and American Express rose to help lift the Dow. Monday marked the first full trading day since Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said on Friday that the time has come to start cutting interest rates. To that end, investors will look to this Friday's personal consumption expenditure data for July, the central bank's preferred inflation gauge. Canada, following the lead of the United States and European Union, said it would impose 100% tariff on imports of Chinese electric vehicles and also announced a 25% tariff on imported steel and aluminium from China. Chinese-made electric vehicles face a new set of tariffs, this time from Canada. The country said Monday it would impose a 100% duty on imports of the cars. That follows similar moves by the US and EU. The levies make no exception for Tesla vehicles manufactured in China. That's in contrast with Europe, which gave Elon Musk's firm a lower rate in return for cooperating with its probe into Chinese exports. Tesla shares fell over 3% following the news. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said Ottawa was acting to counter what he called Beijing's intentional overcapacity. Responding to the news, China's embassy in Canada called the move protectionist and said Ottawa was ignoring World Trade Organization rules. The new tariffs also include a 25% duty on Chinese metals including steel. And Trudeau said punitive measures on chips and solar cells could follow. US President Joe Biden in May quadrupled tariffs on Chinese EVs to 100%. The EU has imposed duties going up to just over 36%. That marks the end of today's bulletin of the Nightly Business Report. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the business globe. Until then, I am Sonia Mudan Nayaka. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.